Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from across Canada. Our mission on the show is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that they call home. And joining us for today's episode is Councillor for the Municipal District of St. Stephen, New Brunswick, Wade Greenlaw. On the St. Croix River and the U.S. border, the Municipal District of St. Stephen is at the very edge of New Brunswick. But it's also at the center of everything that matters most to you. Safe neighborhoods, authentic people, a warm spirit, and get ready to savor every moment like it was a sweet piece of chocolate. Get ready to live your best life in St. Stephen. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at Cross Border Interviews. Councillor, thank you so much for sitting down with me this morning and talking about yourself and the beautiful community of St. Stephen. I want to start by talking about you, though, a little bit. And I want to get the million dollar question that I always start of all my interviews off the bat right away. And that is, Wade, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here today, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, it all started back about 2006 or 2007, where uh, we had um, a request for people interested in being members of the local service district uh, committee. And I went down and and threw my name in the hat and ended up being the chair and subsequently ended up on the Regional Service Commission Board of Directors. And uh, it was, so what it was was basically a lot of questions about you know, where your money's being spent, taxes, and if it's being properly managed. So I said, you know, I can either sit and complain or I can get a get a glove and get in the game. So I, I get in the game and uh, a big learning curve, actually. Thought I thought I knew a lot. I didn't. And uh, anyway, and um, subsequently it's it's led to, uh, you know, uh, me being on a planning management committee there, being on the planning review and adjustment committee. So a lot about economic development and being able to see what's going on and, and, and what's coming, what's, uh, you know, what's, what's growing in, in the whole region actually, and trying to push regionalization for economies of scales on a lot of things from solid waste and planning and, and all that kind of stuff. Then uh, the, uh, the uh, government, the, the conservative government decided to actually uh, initiate local government reform. And I got asked to be on, um, on the, uh, tr the transition team for that. So um, that was, uh, a very frustrating process. It's not not collaborative process. Um, and when it ended, it ended abruptly with uh, a whole bunch of unanswered questions and a whole bunch of things not clear. So I felt for the sake of continuity, I had to continue down the down the line. And the only way I could do that was run for municipal councillor for for our ward. So that's how I ended up as a municipal councillor. Okay, so there's a few questions I want to unpack there, and I want to start yeah. by that last statement there about the sort of the reforms that are still challenging. Let's let's use that word if you don't mind. We are now two years after the amalgamation process throughout the province of New Brunswick. Do you believe that St. Stephen's is in a better place now than it was when the the amalgamation process originally happened in twenty twenty three? I do. I think I think we are better. I think, you know, at first, uh, of course, I was skeptical, um, but I can see to survive in today's world, we need to join together a little better and, and we need to, you know, um, kind of just instill a sense of community with the, with the rural folks as well as the in-town folks. It's so hard now to, to try to maintain, um, you know, maintain infrastructure and maintain services that, uh, you know, everybody needs to chip in. Everybody needs to be to be part of it. So I, I I do feel we're in a in a in a much better spot now than we were. And I think 
um, if we continue down the right path, I think it's it's going to it's going to even get better. Perfect. Now we're, I want to turn back to you because this is the first segment and I want to talk about who you are and get to know a little bit more about the man behind the persona of counselor. Why was municipal politics your first choice of the level of politics that you wanted to get involved with? Because your background, which we, we talked about uh, in our pre-interview, it would have probably be best served at the municipal or provincial level. Was there a reason why you chose municipal or provincial or federal level? Sorry. Was there a reason why you chose the municipal level to get your feet wet a little bit? Well, it's just that I wanted to get my feet wet a little bit first to see if it was something that uh, that I would want to continue with um, as far as going to the next level. And, you know, um, my my whole life has been and my whole work career has been you you start at this level and you learn and you grow and you develop and then you move move to the next level. So I don't like to jump steps. <laughs> and uh, so I thought I'd get into the grassroots and, and learn and, and each thing that you that you learn at the municipal level. Um, transitions over into into the other levels anyway. It gives you a better understanding of the process. Is it what you expected though? Because a lot of times when I do this show and I speak to first term counselors or first term mayors, they often say, it, it, "I expected something. I just didn't expect the workload or the amount of time that I'm going to be putting into the job." Because they think that a life of a municipal counselor is one meeting a week or one meeting a month for you. Had you looked at municipal politics or paid attention to sort of the lifestyle and what you'd be getting into if you were elected? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, but my like I've always been um, if I'm in, I'm in 100 percent. And uh, so I, I I do probably way more than I have to. Um, but um, it's it's just my my nature to do that. And my I, I love to talk to people. Anywhere I go, I ask people how they are, what they're doing, what's what's eating their lunch, um, and uh, and I probably stick my nose in a lot of places that's not supposed to be in. Nuclear, where, which is where I came from, is a very intrusive uh, industry, so um, I'm used to asking asking intrusive questions and used to performance management, and uh, sometimes that's not welcomed in you know a municipal environment, but it 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 does help, right? If you if you learn that it's not about um, trying to um trying to make you look bad it's about trying to help how do you do that because municipal governments across canada right now and i'm just going to focus on new brunswick are going through a bit of a challenging time right now from from your perspective you are the choice that you are the decision that makes the bylaws that that makes the policies that are crafted at council and the administration goes out and administers those directions how do you make, and I say this as you, as the counselor individually, how do you make sure you're making the best choice and the make best decision for your community, knowing that you're going to possibly upset somebody with the decision you make? Well, like, like uh, I, I try to make educated decisions. So anything that we're going to Is that decision, hard, though? Is that it's, hard? It's, it, it, it is. Like, I, I always come to the point where, where when I make the decision, I can hold my hand on my heart. And say I have researched this to death, and I've looked at every avenue, and in you know in the greater good, this is the way we need to go. Um, so you know I, I I very rarely back up on a decision. The odd time I do kind of get caught up in things, and I do make an emotional decision, um, and 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 you usually regret those. But but I I do I I research and and educate myself uh, all the time, and I try to help the constituents do the same. So if I get a call from somebody and they're asking me about something, I say, here, look at this act, look at this section of the act, or, you know, here's some best practices in, in, in other places that have helped. So I, I, I try to help them understand the, the pressures we're under and the resources we have to work with and why, why decisions were made. So making those best decisions and educating yourself is very important. I, I will completely agree with that, but there's an apathy within municipal government that not a lot of people will give their feedback to municipal councillors like they would a provincial or federal. And your education can't just come from that those reports that administration prepares for you at those council meetings. They have to come from the general public as well. Do you get a sense in St. Stephen's that people want to engage with you on the issues? And when you ask for their opinion, they will give you their unfiltered biased opinion in the community. Yeah, there's no there's no doubt here 
Really? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I get calls all the time. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rural ward uh, counselor, but grew up here, spent my whole life here. And I tend to get more calls from people from the, the uh, uh, urban ward than the rural wards, because typically they have a few more issues. Um, but there's no, like, they don't see me as like, they just see me as a community member. They don't see me as, as a, as a rural counselor. Um, but yeah, I, I but feedback you, all the time. Do you see yourself as a rural counselor? Because when you're sworn in, you're not sworn in as a rural counselor, you're sworn in as, as a St. Stephen counselor. So even if it is an urban person, urban residents uh, calling you, you still have to take them seriously while you were elected by the rural voters you're there to represent everyone, even those who disagree with you, or even those who don't live in your ward. That, exactly. So there, there are decisions. This is why I, that I take the time to research everything um, to the point where I drive some people crazy. But um, I, you know, like there are decisions that I'm going to make that that I that I hold my my hand in my heart and I say this is something that is a rural ward issue and a rural ward issue only, and it needs to move in this direction. And then there's ones that are for the greater good for the greater municipality. So it, it is a balancing act. Um, and I, and I try to make sure that um, because what's important to the rural wards is not necessarily important to the urban wards. So, so you have to be able to communicate both, you know, to both uh, areas and you have to be able to understand their issues and their concerns because they are quite different. Now you've used the statement, the greater good twice already in this interview, and we're not even 10 minutes in. <laughs> What is the greater good in municipal politics? Well, I think I think it's, you know, greater good is, is that if we're going to move in a direction, if we're going to make a decision, create a bylaw, it it helps our area, like the whole municipality, rather than than, you know, in one one specific ward or one specific area. Yeah. And uh sometimes they're not popular, right? You know, you you have to look at them from a, you know, how's it going to help us now? How's it going to help us down the road? I do a lot of what they call critical critical thinking. So I'll actually take a list and I go through the critical thinking list. We're, we're going to make a decision and say, who is this going to affect? What's what's the worst thing that can happen? So on and so forth. So I try to analyze that way um, so that, you know, usually there's no big surprises to me. Is that hard? Because you want to be, you want to make sure you're doing the greater good uh, for the community, but Sometimes that can be in contrast of what's the what the residents want. And now you're elected by the people and you have to understand that the people hold your job in the line. So in four years time or two years time, they'll be up for reelection. If you don't adhere to what they want, you're possibly looking for a new job in two years time. So how do you balance the greater good with the community feedback that you hear? Because I can imagine sometimes they are in contrast with each other. They are, but but I don't make decisions based on getting reelected. I I make decisions based on. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you for that honest answer. Thank you so much for that honest answer. I'm so happy that you just said that, and good on you. Sorry, continue. It's it's it, it's tough because you do take grief, um, and sometimes you lose friends actually, and uh, you know it, it. Some people take these things personally. I like if somebody gets mad at me and 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 gets upset with me, I don't take it personally. It's it's a you know it's the type of thing that. Uh, you know, uh, you, you have to empathize, you have to have some emotional intelligence there and you have to understand they're upset for a reason and you can't tell people that they don't have a right to have to have their uh, feelings. But my my whole reason for getting in this was to try to make things better and not so that I could, you know, be a counselor or move on to the next level of government or, you know, whatever. And in, in a couple of years when the election happens, if, if I'm if I'm not not reelected, there's some other way that I can give to the community. Like yeah. there's other, I'm on a bunch of different boards of directors. Um, and, you know, I, I help out wherever I can. I'm, I'm, I'm retired. And one of the reasons that I did retire was because I felt if I run for municipal council, if I really want to do a good job, I can't maintain a, 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 a the type of job I had, you know, something's going to give. And uh, so I, I was in a position to retire and I, and I retired so I could focus on this. Now we're recording this almost four days after the uh, the provincial elections in the province of New Brunswick. And when I when I asked you about apathy, you said people are engaged, which is great. And I love the, that people are engaged because I think municipal governance and municipal politics is the closest to the people and it makes the biggest impact. But do you 
get a sense that the when people do engage with you, they're engaging with you on strictly municipal issues. Are they coming to you about water, wastewater, or are they coming to you about provincial issues or even because you are so close to the U.S. border, federal issues as well? Do you get a sense that they know where they should be directing their questions or their line of inquiries to? Yeah, that's that, that's a broad spectrum. Um, not a lot of federal issues, many provincial issues. Um, they, they, I think, because because I think uh, if they do speak to the to the MLA and they don't get a response, then th their next step is to go to the municipal person to see if we can help. But what we actually did was we did a, a an, an infographic up to say if you if it's these types of issues, you call us. If it's these types of issues, you call your MLA. If it's these types of issues, you call your federal guy. And and you know, so it it kind of helped a bit to you know that people weren't calling us. Um, you know, for issues that we don't have resources or expertise in that are really outside our, our, our control. We do advocate, but we don't, uh, we don't, we don't control yet. But you can't tell somebody, no, that's not my jurisdiction. So you have to go talk to your MLA because I, I would hazard a guess. And I, I hate painting a broad stroke on this show, but I do it a lot. Um, you are the closest to them. You make a decision. You're in the grocery store the next morning or that night after yeah. you've made that decision. Yeah. When the MLA goes to Fredericton, they're coming back probably a week later after the session is recapped or the MP is going to Ottawa and they probably will come to the riding once or twice during the times that they are in the constituents week. How do you tell people it's not your jurisdiction when they are literally, you are the closest to them. So they are asking you because they're probably getting a better chance to get a response from you rather than their MLA and MP. And I'm not saying that their MLA and MP is bad. I'm just saying it is more likely to see, they're more likely to see you rather than those two other two levels of government. Yeah. So I have a great relationship and I establish relationships with the MLA, with the MP, meet with them, you know, monthly almost. And, uh, you know, and they'll they'll call me if, if they if there's something they've heard on the grapevine that they'd like some information on and, and 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 vice versa. So I try to educate myself on as much as I can. So when I run into somebody in the superstore and and my wife rolls her eyes like I'm just gonna move on because you're gonna be here for half an hour. <laughs> I I try to do my best to, to to help them understand, you know, um the whole, you know, whatever they're asking about. And if there's something that I can answer, I I tell them that and I and I'll try to find a way to, to go find the answer and, and, and get the information to them. I want to turn to the uh, next segment, if you don't mind, because sure. I feel like this is going to be a fun segment because uh, I haven't talked to that many municipal leaders across New Brunswick and I'm adding on to it every week. So I'm so happy that you're able to sit down with me. And I want to talk about the, 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 the municipal district of St. Stephen's. I want to make sure I get that name right. And, before I do, I want to preface this line of questioning with the following statement. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and his opinion alone. Now, it may match up with what's going on at council and what the direction of council is going, but at the end of the day, it's still his opinion. That being said, he still needs a majority to pass anything and get anything through. So this is one man's opinion who happens to sit on council about what's going on in the municipal district of St. Stephen. Okay, with that being said, um, Councillor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the community today? Well, it, you know, so me Personally, not not what I think your 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 uh, normal citizen would see. I see uh, here it is our our, our uh, well it's too. It's affordable housing, you know, because of the economy right now and trying to uh, you know trying to um, help people be able to to you know to live in in decent housing and to be able to afford to eat and be able to afford to 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 heat themselves you know heat the houses and so on and so forth. Um, the second would be our our infrastructure backlog huge infrastructure backlog across the province. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of it you don't see because it's underground, it's road conditions, it's the condition of municipal buildings, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. And so, so, so let's, kind of let's talk about, let's talk about housing for a second, because you're not the first and you will not be the last person on my show to talk about housing. Um, 
municipalities do not build houses. I could not (laughs) reiterate that enough. They do not. They build the infrastructure to go to those houses. They permit the houses. What is the municipal district doing today to ensure that more houses get built? Because contractors, and I've spoken to a few, say they will not go to municipalities unless the infrastructure is in place, the, uh, the zones are all set up, and that means you have to put the cart before the horse, and therefore you have to ensure that things are set up, which house brings tax dollars and you have to spend tax dollars to bring those houses to you. How do you, how do you solve an issue when you are so, and I say you as in all municipalities, financially strained right now with the amount of infrastructure dollars that you have to be able to build these houses? Yeah, there's, there's no, uh, you know, we don't have a big, uh, a big cash reserve and, 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 and lots of money to, to toss around, but we, we were ahead of game. Uh, we've got a great uh, planning board. We did our, our housing needs assessment and, uh, and, you know, and we've applied and received uh, a fair amount of funding from, from, uh, you know, the federal and provincial governments for uh, pre-construction and, and, and infrastructure. We just recently got approved to extend uh, y- utilities to a, to another uh, lot um, we're active on economic development. And I think in the next, there's, there's three or four projects that are going to start in the next year. And then in the next three years, we're pretty close to 200 units going in. Is, is that, is that the, the, the amount that you need, or is there much more that can be done? Uh, there's more that can be done. <laughs> what that will do is that creates a, uh, a little bit of a supply and demand issue. So if we can if we can get to the point where we've got options, then then what it will do is it will help drive rents down. Um, right now, like there's a, there's a shortage of, of housing here, and uh, you know so um, rents can be, you know rents get elevated, supply and demand. Um, but when we put, you know we're we're looking at one unit, uh, one apartment building, a hundred and eight units, I think. One is 50, uh, 50 plus affordable. And there's another one that I think is 20 units and a lot of family ones in there. Another one that's actually MB Housing's building that's five family units. So what those will do is they'll help free up, um, you know, that 108 apartment building. There's a lot of seniors that are in houses or people that are looking to downsize that will move into those apartments that will open up other other opportunities and it will help uh, help with the uh, the current supply and demand situation and drive the rent down. So we are actively pursuing um we're always trying to find ways to get, um, you know, developers in here. We've got a great incentive package, um, and we've uh, we've done a lot of work with the planning and the zoning to try to make sure that it is it is shovel ready. Um, we're not quite where we need to be with that. I'd like to be able to to say we've got another five or six um, pieces of land uh, that were you know 100% developer ready, but we are actively moving down that road. One one of the main challenges with uh, bringing more houses online in municipalities is the NIMBYism. And I'm yeah. not sure if it's alive and well in uh, St. Stephen, but uh, it is alive and well across this country where people have moved to communities or love their communities because of the way it is today or it was 10 years ago. How do you, and I say you as the council, you council, you like the entire council and even your role, how do you see your role in bringing people who don't want to the community to change over to a side where they know that if the community does not change and grow, that means your tax dollars are going to go up. That means the people who are living there right now who don't want it to grow your tax dollars are going to go up and you can't blame us because we're trying to make your tax dollars stay s- s- sort of level knowing that they're going to be upset that it's growing. Well, that's, that's a simple explanation, right? To say, you know, if, if we don't grow, everything's going to get more, more expensive for for you. Um, but we're, you know, like we're, we're, you know, um, supposed to be taking care of all of society, not just one, one class or two, two class of, uh, of society. So, it is difficult sometimes, you know, and, and we don't see it as much here. People in, in this town are, are are relatively tolerant of, of that sort of thing. Um, you know, uh, they understand pe- people need to live. People have to have housing. Uh, and a lot of people can't afford a $300,000 home. 
Um, so, you know, they understand the need for that. And in most cases, you know, if it's a, if it's a well planned and well, um, structured, um, you know, housing bill, there's usually no issues. It's just going to be thought of a little bit. Right. And then, and then, you know, it, it needs to be socialized the right way with, with the residents and, uh, to make sure that some of the, if they have fears, those fears are, those fears are alleviated and there's, you know, and they've, and they've, they've at least been heard right are they happy to just be heard or do they want action in in some cases um you know when it comes into you know some situations around shelters and and, and things like that yeah there's uh you know there's there's a lot of opposition almost no matter where you would put those sort of things but uh you know um like i say we need to take care of all of society you also talked about one of the challenges that the municipality faces is infrastructure and the yes. sort of the infrastructure deficit. Now, um, I recently spoke to the the Union of Municipalities of New Brunswick president, uh, Brittany Merrifield. That episode came out literally the day we're recording this um, yeah. about the new Holt government and how she hopes this government will address the backlog of infrastructure deficits that municipalities are facing in the tune of up to $300 million a year annually across the province. Um what is the priority for you as a municipal uh, council to address this shortfall? Because we talk about how you can't build houses on the backs of people who are already there. If you do not grow, your infrastructure is going to deteriorate. It's going to be dilapidated and you're going to have bigger issues rather than 300 million. You're going to be half a half a billion dollar issue in a few years time. If these issues don't get fixed. What does the municipality, municipal district of St. Stephen do in the short term to address the infrastructure backlog that you have, knowing that you can't go ask people every single day that we're going to have to raise your taxes 10%, 20%, one case in BC, 39% to address some of these backlogs? Yeah, you can't, it's you, like you, like you said, you can't, you can't grow economically on the backs of residential taxes and you can't necessarily um, um, build and 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 refurbish infrastructure on the backs of residential taxes. So that has to come from from other sources like grants. Uh, you know the uh, it, it used to be called the gas tax. There it's the it's the Canadian Community Building Fund there now. So we we do apply for grants there. There's uh, there's help in certain areas with the municipal government, the municipal provincial highway program, where you know some of the streets in our town are actually parts of highways because we are uh, gateway to Canada, right? Yeah. Um, and um, so, but the, the big thing that we're trying to do now is 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 to uh, get a good uh, asset management plan done. We just finished a, a pavement condition index study, so we know where our roads are. We know what infrastructure underneath the roads needs to be needs to be redone. So you you plan to to tear up a road based on its its uh, its its index number, but you know when you tear that one up, you have to separate the sewer and the water. So you have to have, you know, so on and so forth. And then we're also looking at if we grow much more, then we need to add possibly to our, our water supply. And, you know, so we're we're constantly trying to look ahead as part of as part of a strategic plan and an asset management plan to maintain what we've got, but then try to build in, you know, what we need to actually grow and, and attract um, development. So and this is a big hypothetical question. I hate to talk in hypotheticals, but I'm going to for this question. Hypothetically, Premier designate Susan Holt uh, comes out tomorrow and says, "We're going to back. We're going to backfill all the issues that municipalities have when it comes to infrastructure funding. So we're going to give you the two hundred dollars, two hundred million dollars annually every year, and we're going to back it, backdate it for the two point five billion that you have outstanding already as well." Yeah. hypothetical we know that possibly is not going to happen but let's say a hypothetical what would be priority number one for the municipal district of saint stephen oh my goodness there's just there's just a <laughs> um like just like in in my opinion and i do preface a lot of my emails with that um <laughs> i would have to say that you know there's 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 some roads right now and uh and you know uh lift stations and and you know part of our um, sewer and water system, which is a utility, by the way, um, and uh, that that needs you know needs some TLC, um, and then I mean it's just there. There's just so many things. It's really hard for me to answer that. 
No, uh, understandable. And I apologize. Yeah. I, I know we, I hate no, no. talking hypotheticals with people who literally yeah. have to, like, numbers are the num name of the game in municipalities. So it's I appreciate the, it's the it. chasing the car and you catch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now what do we do, right? Because we get the money, and it would be everybody be tripping over themselves on on what we were going to spend it on. Um, you know, we we do have other issues here, like in, and I think it's across a lot of areas in Canada with with um, you know uh, primary health care. We have a, a real shortage of doctors here. So many people, and 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 then that affects people's health, and they're hospitalized more, so on and so forth. And you know, um, even though it's not necessarily our our thing to do. Uh, you know, a collaborative healthcare center that would, you know, and help put the infrastructure in for that. And, uh, you know, we could possibly spend some of the money on that. I appreciate the honesty there. So you've talked about two very big macro issues on this show, housing and infrastructure, which are relatively the largest macro issues that a lot of municipalities are dealing with. But I would hazard a guess that if I went to St. Stephen tomorrow and I asked a hundred people in your community, what the biggest issue they're all going to have very different answers. They may talk about infrastructure. I'm probably assuming not a lot because they don't see that because that's not the quote unquote sexy thing that they can see. And you can't sort of promote, hey, we just fixed a water line. Well, my water's turned on every day, so I'm okay with that. How does the council and how do you balance the macro issues, which are the important issues to the council with the micro issues, and I say micro as the individual issues that residents have, because you have a limited supply of money. You can't run a deficit every year like the province and the federal government. Right. So you have to tell people no sometimes that your issue is not going to be fixed because this is a bigger issue to the community. But when they pay their property taxes, they want to feel like they're getting something for that dollar that they're giving to the municipality. How do you balance the two, uh, not opposing, but two fractions within the municipal district to ensure that people feel like they're getting their fair share of what they pay for? So so what we do is, and in, in we started it last year, and we just started it again this year, is our budget sessions, like we tend, we, we, we make them public, and we actually have a public engagement session where we actually bring the, the public in, and we and we go through a budget exercise so that they get to actually take like, like last year we did, we actually had them have fake money. And then they talked about what their priorities were. And then afterwards, everybody went around, put their money in, in the, the, the bins, but most of them ran out of money before they got to all their priorities. So it was a, it was a very good um, way to, to help people understand that, you know, we only have so many resources without jacking your taxes up and, and we, and we get outside money as much as we can but, you know, in the end, we, we can only do so much. So some people, you know, like some person's street that's in really bad shape, sometimes we have to say we, we can patch it, but we can't pave that for two more years or three more years. It's in this in this queue, right? Um, you know, when it comes to the basic services, you know, uh, those things have to be maintained. We like to be proactive on them. Sometimes we're reactive. And, of course, that's very expensive when you're when you're reactive. But, you know. Um, like myself and, and any of the counselors are, are very approachable and very, um, very concerned about, you know, citizens and making sure citizens have what they need. And, um, and most of them will, will, um, if there's a, if there's a micro issue like that, they will, they'll run it up the flagpole and see what can and can't be done. In some cases we can, you know, help. In some cases we just have to say, we're sorry. We'll, we'll put it in the, in the queue and, and get to it when, when there's uh, resources available. I want to flip the original question on its head a little bit for a second, if you don't mind. And we talk about the challenges and I don't want people to go away from this interview thinking that St. Stephen is full of challenges, which they're not. You have some things that are going good for you as well. So yeah. when you look at the community as a whole and you go to talk to people from UMNB or even the Federation of Canadian Municipalities or even communities across the, the pro province that are just in your neighborhood, What's the thing you talk to them about the most when you say, I'm proud of our community bees, we've got X going for us? Well, like we we have a great event center, you know, athletic uh, center, the Carson Civic Center. And uh, and that's a, a wonderful place to host tournaments and and and, and that kind of stuff. And then um, in the last few years here, we've got uh, the world's oldest basketball court. And I don't know if you knew that, 
Um, but it, I the, did not. the world's oldest basketball court exists in our town, and we're in a process now. There's a group of people, um, very dedicated people, that are developing that into a like a, a basketball experience. So there, it'll be an interactive experience. They've actually got, um, you know, some commitments from the Basketball Hall of Fame and 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 NBA players. They do a, they do a big fundraising golf tournament every year with a lot of celebrities. Um, they do three on three tournaments, all that kind of stuff. And uh, if if you know if you go on it's uh, world's oldest basketball court dot com, you can see, uh, you know, you can see it and you can see the, um, you know, what's what's going on. It's a very well uh, well organized thing that I forget how much money they have now. Thirteen million dollar project, um, and they've got several million now, and they're and they're working on some government funding and and so on and so forth to kick it off. So that's one of the things that you know we're we uh, very very proud of that that's in the community and and it's and it's finally being recognized. It so when I was doing research, a I didn't come across that. So I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more about that. And for anyone who wants to learn more, the link to the world's world or oldest basketball court ca is in the show notes. So please check that out. Um, dot com. Dot yes. com. Sorry, I even wrote down dot com and then it said dot ca because I'm yeah. it's just the trick of the mouth. Um, it seems like, and I hate to say it seems like, but Saint Stephen's is a tourist haven. Because you have the Croy River, you have a lot of things going for you that a lot of municipalities don't have the option or get the ability to have. So from a tourist perspective, what are some of the highlights that you just love talking about and hope people go to? Well, um, you know, like I say, as, as far as, as, as natural tourism and, 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 and sports tourism, like we've got multiple rivers and lakes and, and you know, that you can fish. We're, we're right, right on the ocean as well within 30 kilometers you can it, it, there's st andrews is there st george is there uh you know st andrews is, is a seaside resort town they they've got all the things that that any any uh sea, it there's as nice a place as any place in canada st stephen's got got different things we're kind of a of a of a service hub so you know there's more more um you know if you want your groceries better and, and things like that we're we're here uh, you know, we got the international um, border. There are actually three international boarding cross border crossings in the municipal district of St. Stephen. And uh, it's it's a wonderful place to visit the trails, um, parks and, uh, you know, it's quiet. Uh, there's there's not a lot of traffic. We got great, great restaurants here and uh, the downtowns like the downtowns of, of St. Andrews and St. Stephen are, are quaint and, uh, you know, nice, nice to walk. And, um, you know, it, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a great place to raise kids as, as well and bring a family up. Um, okay. I hate bringing up the C word that we just went through, but I'm going to have to for this question. COVID-19 and tourism, they got, COVID-19 decimated the tourism sector within yep. Canada. As a border community that borders the uh, the state of Maine, which is your closest partner, I can imagine that it probably did take a toll on your community. Has it come back to where it was prior to the sort of the global pandemic? Oh yeah, it has. It's uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of cross border um, marriages and families on both sides. And I know I, 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 I didn't actually uh, face to face uh, some of my family members for, for almost a year. And uh, you know, so it, 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 it was tough, but it's, it's come right back. And uh you know, um, and you don't realize how much you're tied to to the you know like Callis and St. Stephen uh, are we have an international festival, and the parade actually starts in one country and goes through the customs into the other country. We do that every every summer, and there's and we co-sponsor events, and it's been going on for for uh, geez, I think. Uh, oh. When is when is that event? Because now I want to go down and visit this. This it's called the International <laughs> Homecoming Festival. Okay, <laughs> so, and 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 they and they uh, co they they align it also with the chocolate festival. Of course, of course, we are home to okay. the chocolate em empire. And uh, okay, yes, I'm very glad you brought up chocolate because when I send when I approach people for this show, I check to find their email addresses on the municipal district's website, and I found the your email, 
and it had chocolate in it. And I was like, what is this all about? And I was trying to figure out, like, am I, is this like a fishing exercise where this is actually not the email for the counselors? So you guys are well known for being like kind of the chocolate capital of New Brunswick, if not Canada, right? Yeah, chocolate capital of Canada. And and uh, there's there's arguments over where the first chocolate bar was, was invented. You know, we, we say it was here. Other people say it was other places. But, uh, but yeah, the 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 Canon chocolate, uh, uh, you know, business has been here for, you know, ever and uh and it is an integral part of the community and uh yeah so they, they we have a chocolate festival that coincides with the international festival and there's a bunch of different events there's the chalk tail hour which everybody gets dressed up and goes in and has chocolate martinis and and it's a fundraiser for the for the iwk children's hospital um there's you know it's it, it's really really fun time to be here those uh those couple of weeks in in august yeah Next August, it's a municipal date. I'm coming to yeah. St. Stephen's for the chocolate festival. You don't get this size without being a, a chocolate fan. <laughs> you'll, you'll fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear. Is, is there a spot in the community that you can go to after a long day? Because while you you are relatively retired, I say that because knowing the role of a municipal councillor is not a one day a week job. It is a 24 hour a week job. You go out to your community, you are inundated by questions. You, you jokingly said that when you go to the grocery store and people stop, your wife just literally continues to walk away from you. <laughs> Is there a spot that you can go after a long day or just to decompress after a stressful meeting, stressful uh, conversation that you can just let it all go, knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to have to wake up and do it all over again? Yeah, um, plenty of places to go. Um, you know, the, there's a, there's a waterfront trail that we invested that that uh, that actually goes right from the international uh, border crossing, the Ferry Point Bridge, and it goes you know for probably a kilometer and a half right on the water, right on the river. It's absolutely beautiful walking trail. You can go for a walk there. There's lots of benches to sit on, um, and it's it's a busy trail, but it's um, it, anybody on the trail is in a wonderful mood. They're out for a walk. They're walking their dogs. It's just a happy environment to be in. The, the other place I go is 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 the Ganong Nature Park. So about eight kilometers uh, downriver on a peninsula, the Ganong family donated uh, a piece of their family land that was a was a, like a summer cottage at one time, and uh, and it's it's a it's a nature park, and um, and I'm actually on the board of directors for that as as well. And we do we do an event called the Charlotte County Fall Fair, which is an agricultural family fair. It's gotten bigger every year and, uh, you know, a uh, wonderful place to bring the kids. Um, so that park is, is um, you know, I mean, during daylight hours, you can go down there and, and there's wonderful trails along the shore, trails through the woods. And it's just, it's just absolutely beautiful down there. It's, it's quiet and, uh, and um, there's lots of access to the, like it actually is the peninsula where the Walweed River and the St. Croix River meet and, and, and move on down towards St. Croix Island and, uh, and uh, in, in St. Andrews. So it's a beautiful spot. So you're on the board of the UMNB. You're on yeah. the Ganon board. Yeah. You're a counselor. Yeah. What do you do for your downtime? Like I can imagine you're quite busy with just doing those three, but is there, like, what do you do for fun? <laughs> Well, that a lot of that's fun to me because because I'm an extrovert. I'm in with people. I, I I love playing stuff. I love helping with stuff. So that that's a lot of the fun. I do get a little golfing in now and then. And and you know my 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 wife Lisa and I are foodies. So we go out every Friday night with family for a meal. We spread it around. So we you know we don't go to the same place every every Friday night. We try to spread the spread the love around as as I call it. Um, uh, you know we. We travel a little bit when we can when we can squeeze it in and uh yeah so that's pretty much the fun and and i have um you know i i live outside of town a little bit and i have uh you know um i just recently bought another piece next to me so i've got around 50 acres here now so i'll go out in the woods and with a clearing axe and and you know i get my own fur tips to make my wreaths with at christmas time and and uh and cut a little firewood and things like that so that's, okay that's fun yeah, so we're ending this on the best topic, Christmas, <laughs> which is great. 
but yeah. you said something that perked my interest as an avid golfer myself. What's yeah. the, what's your favorite course that you can go to in New Brunswick, or is there one in locally that you go to that you can go hit nine or eighteen holes? Well, I'll I'll tell you, like we're lucky. Callus has has a little nine hole course. That's a wonderful course if you just want a nice easy uh, golf and uh, and uh, you know they got a great clubhouse. And uh, Saint Stephen has a beautiful course, eighteen hole course, and and it's uh, it's you know um, very close to town, very reasonable. Um, and in fact, most of the time, that's that's where we golf. St. Andrews, of course, the Algonquin has has a world class golf course down there. Beautiful Lynx course. And there's also another small um, golf course halfway in between. That's a that's a you just put 10 bucks in the in the slot and you and you go play. It's a nice little, little nine hole course. And uh, yeah. So, OK, so, so I make it I make it a trip to New Brunswick. I'll knock on wood if everything goes to plan this summer. Twenty twenty five. I'm in New Brunswick. Yeah, we're going we're going for nine holes. OK, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> so before I let you go, because we're almost we're at the we're almost at the 15 minute mark here. But I've got to ask a simple question. And that is, well, it's a, not a simple question. It's a million dollar question. What makes the municipal district of St. Stephen such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family. Oh, I think it's it's it, like you know it's it. They're old old towns. They've been here. Like St. Stephen of Cal's been here, you know, long, long, long time. Uh, and um, the the fact that it's that it's a border community makes it unique because it's it's almost seamless. It's you know there's a there's a there's an international bridge and there's and there's customs on either side, but. Most of the time, people look at those as just a pain in pain in the butt to get me to the other side. You know, the the the, the communities are are, are uh, very very close, and um, and there's so many benefits to living on on the border both both ways. So I I would say that's part of it, and the fact that we're in one of the nicest uh, you know most beautiful parts of Canada, we're not. Uh, urbanized to the point where we're sprawling cities. We're still, you know, even though we're a municipality, we're still very rural. So there's lots of land, lots of space, um, lots of room for for that outdoor recreation. If you're a hunter or fisher, there's there's tons of stuff like that to do. So it's, uh, um, yeah, it's it's yeah. I, I I actually purposely moved back here. I was in the U.S. Navy subs, and when I get out of, you know, finally finished. I, I could have stayed in Connecticut or one of those places and and, and probably made a lot more money and had a, had a more uh, lucrative career. But I wanted my, my children to grow up in an area like this and be around family and friends. Yeah. So, so move, move back here and, and don't regret it for, for a minute. So uh, I know I said that was going to be the last question, but you, you've perked my interest a little bit here. And I, how is your, like, what is the closest community on the U.S. border on the side of the border? Is there a community yeah. just right on the other side of the international? Yeah. Oh, border? yeah. You can like if I'm if I'm if I'm standing if I'm sitting on the deck at the coffee shop on the front street of St. Stephen, I'm looking across at at the at the uh, um, Hardwick's gas station and convenience store on the other side of the river. It's Calais, Maine. C A L A I S. Calais is how you pronounce it if you were in France, but they all call it Calais. So being a border a, community, do you have a good working relationship with their council as well? Yeah, they, they, uh, yeah. Um, no, uh, like, you know, their, their mayor, no, I've, I've known Artie for years and, and, uh, and, and our, we do, we do a ceremony together on the Ferry Point Bridge in the middle of the bridge, both, both sets of councillors and stuff come together in the middle of the bridge and we exchange flags to open the festival. And uh, and then the International Festival Committee is made up of members from both both communities, so they coordinate all the events and so on and so forth. Wow, well, yeah. I, this is the first time that someone's actually said cross border on the cross border network. That's not <laughs> me, so <laughs> I appreciate that. That's why I had to get that question in there. Yeah. Um, Wade, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, you never know how these interviews are going to go because you never know how people are going to react to these type of questionings and. I appreciate your honesty, your candor, and your passion because it truly does seem like you have a passion for your community, but also to serve your community. And it doesn't seem like you want to give it up anytime soon. I hope you the long the longest career in municipal politics or whatever <laughs> career path you choose after municipal politics because 
you're you're a hell of a guy. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. Look, I look, I appreciate the opportunity to, 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 to chat. And look, if you want to chat offline anytime, just just give me a call if you got any other questions. And uh, and yeah, I uh, I I most of the time I enjoy this very much. There's the odd time where I, I do get frustrated. Uh, typically not at the citizens. <laughs> just at the media, right? At the council, and, and, and yes, I do. I get I get frustrated, and yeah. But, uh, but I can I, I can I can usually write the ship, uh, you know. As far as me there, I get yeah. <laughs> well, I do appreciate you taking your time to sit down with us today and talk about this. I like I said, I'm looking forward to visiting St. Stephen next year. I'm putting it on the record. I keep on saying that, but I was out in New Brunswick earlier this year just for a funeral, and I didn't get to tour as much as I wanted to. But next year, I'm going to make a conscious effort to spend a few weeks in New Brunswick because I think it's a province of untapped resources for municipalities and for myself. So thank you so much. Yeah, it is. You you come down. We'll make sure you're, you're, you have lots of fun. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. We truly hope you've enjoyed today's episode with one of Canada's municipal leaders who's truly trying to make a difference within their community. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this or watching this. Your support helps us to continue to grow and bring you more great conversations like you heard today. Until next time, stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you right here on Cross Border Interviews. Until then.